what is freedom? What does it mean to be free? It seems that definition varies between you and me. But should it? Martin Luther King's dream achievable, could it? Or is it a nightmare to keep us right there, arguing over evil, debating what's good, whitewashing the Bible in the very place we stood, considered a thug because my sweatshirt has a hood, but they love to use our slang, my bad, it's all good. It seems I'm free to entertain as long as I stay in my lane and stand for a song written by a slave owner. Ain't that a shame? Jesse Owens embarrassed Hitler, won those gold medals for all of us, and came back to America and had to sit at the back of the bus. Cassius Clay, 1960, won a gold medal for Rome. and still considered a second-class citizen when he came home. Dabo Sweeney said, hey, black people got it good. And he should know, he's made millions off the hood. White coaches make millions from recruiting black children. Blow out your knee, it's okay, they'll find another one to fill in. So honestly, what does it mean to be free? Thank you. So this is going to be more of a conversation than me just standing up here lecturing. So my name is C.J. Miller. I'm a graduate student in the, theater, in the theater department. And I found out about an opportunity to present this 30 minutes before the deadline to submit was due. So I was like, I will talk about sports. Yeah. And then when I started doing my research and figure out what I wanted to talk about, it came into all this whole thing of like, I don't know what some of these things mean. Like I think America is incredibly problematic in how we do sports, especially on the collegiate level and how we treat people. Things don't make sense and I don't have answers. So I figured that I would make this, I have some questions, I have some thoughts, I have some feelings. I'm sure you all have some thoughts and feelings and maybe we can come up with some answers. That sound good to y'all? All right, so I might not be all up here. I might be down there, be all over the place. So let's get this started. So I started with the question, what is freedom? What does it mean to be free? And I posted it on my Facebook page a few days ago and asked people, all right, what do you think it means to be free? And I had some interesting responses. So one of the responses was, living comfortably in the absence of fear. That sounds good. The ability to live life as you see fit. Eh, yeah, I can get down with that too. Anybody have any ideas on what freedom is or what it means to be free? Anyone? You in the back. <laughs> so I was thinking of what it means to be free. And I, I thought about like, so the first thing as an African American, when I think about what it means to be free, I think about slavery being abolished and you're not a slave. But is that all there is though? Like if, if I'm not allowed to attend the college that I got accepted into because I have the grades, because of the color of my skin, is that freedom? I don't know. What do y'all think? Anybody? Show of hands if you think that's freedom. Show of hands if you think that that's not freedom. All right, sir, everybody's listening, okay. That's cool. <laughs> I don't know, but what if so, is the college allowed to have set rules on who they let in though? Is an organization allowed to set rules on, are they free to, let who, to admit who they want to? Anybody? Thoughts? Okay. I don't know, y'all. I seriously don't know. My first thought is like, yeah, that's not freedom. But at the same time, how am I supposed to tell someone how to live their life? But if it's an organization that's about higher knowledge and learning, then that should be something too. I don't know. Let's see. Anybody know who this is? Yes, sir. Jesse Owens. Jesse Owens. Good job. What's your name? Michael. Michael. Thank you. Jesse Owens. Michael, what do you know about Jesse Owens? Uh, African-American sprinter. I think he was in 1936 Olympics. 
at that dude. Hey, yeah. Right? Yeah, 36 Olympics. So what was the big deal about, what was happening in 1936? Anybody know? What was going on in the world? World War II, what's your name? Caroline. Caroline, thank you. World War II was going on. And who was America, who were the big bad bad guys that America was trying to take down in World War II? Anybody? Germany. Japan. Yeah, Japan, but that doesn't fit for my story, so I'm going to just stick with Germany. Germany! And they had this dude named Adolf Hitler who believed in this big Aryan supremacy thing of white people were the most dominant and everything. And Jesse Owens went over there and whooped ass and embarrassed Hitler. <laughs> And Hitler had to like just take that and deal with it. So <laughs> the thing that was so crazy is, let's see if we can find this. So here he is on, on, on the medal stand. So you have Jesse Owens, gold medal winner. You had this man, uh, Lutz Long, he's a German, came in, in uh, second, so he had a silver medal. And then Naoto Tajima from Japan came in bronze or third, so it's bronze. So Toyota Najima went back to his home in Japan. It was considered a hero. Everybody loved him. My man that came in second with a Nazi salute here, German homeboy, everybody loved him, went off to be a war hero. And then you had Jesse Owens, who was not invited by Franklin Delano Roosevelt to the White House. But it wasn't just Jesse Owens, though. FDR didn't have any of the black Olympians to the White House. He only invited the white Olympians to come to the White House. So it's like, yo, what do you have to do to get respect if you're African American? You want a gold medal. You are the best in the entire world and you get nothing? So before he was in the Olympics, Jesse Owens was at Ohio State, and he couldn't live on campus with his white teammates because Ohio State was segregated. So he had to live off campus by himself. He had to eat by himself. The only time he was allowed on campus is when they were running track. So that already makes you feel like you're second rate. But just imagine, like, all right, you're done with college. You're on the Olympic team. You're going to represent your country. Clearly, your country cares about you. They, pick, they chose you to represent them, and you beat everybody in the entire world. And you come back and the President of the United States says, you're not good enough to come here. So if Jesse Owens isn't good enough for the President with a gold medal, who is? Like, I'm not even that fast, so I know he wouldn't have liked me. But FDR wasn't just hating on like Olympians. He also didn't have any of his white staff members in the White House and his black staff members in the White House, he would not allow them to eat together because he didn't think that they should be exchanging ideas. That's FDR, who is, in 2017, they took a poll and he was considered to be the third greatest uh, president of all time. So I'm not even sure how that happens at all. And our slideshow is done. Isn't it? Anybody know who this is? Anybody? Let's think. Anybody know what? Guess the sport. Oh, so now she's gone. Sorry. Guess the sport. Serena. Venus. Yeah. It's tennis. Is it Arthur Ashe? Nope. Close. This is a woman. Arthur Ashe is mad. <laughs> it's all good. We're having technical difficulties, so it's fine. We'll see what we get. I don't know what's going on. Let's try. Okay, we have a slideshow. If it comes back, it comes back. If it doesn't, chill. So Althea Gibson, anybody know who Althea Gibson is? Althea Gibson was the first black tennis player to win a major title in, in tennis. So she preceded Arthur Ashe, she, was, she said, paved the way for Venus and Serena. She wasn't allowed to play tennis with, with white tennis players until she was 23 years old because that was how America was back then. Back when America was great. So we had 
Althea Gibson, who wasn't allowed to compete with white people until she was 23, she had this friend of hers who was a Jewish player from London who when she got, so when, when that Wimbledon, when that happened, her Jewish friend let her stay with him and no one else would. So she got banned from tennis clubs ever, and her Jewish friend said she knew what it liked to be, to be discriminated against because she was Jewish. So that's why she looked out for her. But the question I always thought was like, how come nobody else was looking out for her? Like, does anybody, do we have responsibilities for each other, to look out for each other? Like, I'm an American, you're an American, we're all like people, right? We can play the whole God's children thing. How come nobody's looking out for you? Are you free if you have no friends? Are you free if you have nobody looking out for you? I guess you could be, but it just sucks. Like, the world is against you and nobody cares about you. Oh, this is the next slide was good. Let's see, if, let's see if we do this. Let's see if we do this without a slideshow. Who knows who this is? Spider-Man. Yeah, all right, everybody knows Spider-Man. Somebody tell me the story of Spider-Man. What do they know about Spider-Man? Anybody know the story of Spider-Man? He gets bit by a spider. Why did he start fighting crime? Because his uncle got shot. His uncle, what's his uncle's name? Uncle Ben got shot, and Uncle Ben's dying words to Spider-Man were what? With great power becomes great. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows that. I'm trying to push that if we need a new religion at some point, it should be like Marvel Comics and Spider-Man, because <laughs> everybody knows Spider-Man. And you're going to, what better, whatever better scripture or phrase to live by, then with great power comes great responsibility. So the question is, if I have the ability to help you, do I have a responsibility to help you? What do you think? Anybody? Yeah, no, raise your hand if you think if you have a responsibility to help someone, you're supposed to help them. Raise your hand if you think that if you have, a if you have the ability to help someone, you're still not obligated. I'm not all the way up, but I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. Do you have a little bit too? Yeah, I don't, yeah. It's weird, right? Like, because we have our own thing to take care of. But it, it's hard for me when, when someone makes me aware of something or aware of a problem and I have the ability to do something about it, I feel like I should, even if it means sacrificing some of my own stuff. But I get that. So, what I brought up uh, Spider Man before was because with awesome power, great power comes great responsibility. We have to look out for each other. So who's looking out for Jesse Owens, Althea Gibson, all these other black athletes who are paving the way? And while they're trying to gain their respects and they're considered the popular ones, what about all those black people and African Americans who are not athletically gifted and they have something to say? Do black athletes in the spotlight have a responsibility to be a voice for the voiceless? What do y'all think? No wrong answers. <coughs> Anybody? Do black athletes in the spotlight have a responsibility to be a voice for the voiceless? So check this out. So over the summer, I was working at a work study job and I was spending a lot of time over in uh, in SAC, and I filled out these comment cards, there are these comment cards, and I filled out one of these comment cards every day for the summer. And so you have a comment, it's for diversity and inclusion. So I filled out this comment card for diversity and inclusion every day for the summer, and what I said was, here comes a hot button issue, what I said was the images of white Jesus in classrooms should be taken down because I consider it to be offensive. And, what I, and at the bottom of it, it says, if you leave your name and email on the card, you'll be contacted with. And nobody got back to me. 
every day for the summer. I filmed one of these cars out, and I was back there to be like, dude, chill. It's never going to happen. Shut up. Stop filling out the cars. That's what I was expecting, and I was okay with that because I'm like, yeah, you, you have the right to do what you want to do. You have the right to believe what you want to believe, but at least respect me. And if you disagree with me, ask me why you disagree, and maybe we can have a conversation. Maybe you'll change your mind. Maybe I'll change my mind. Maybe nobody changes their mind, but we understand where everybody's coming from. But nobody got back to me. So I was like, why does anybody care about me? Why does diversity and inclusion not care about my voice? And it's maybe because I'm not cool enough. So y'all know Mikhail Bridges? Was here last year? You think if he would have stood up and said, we should get rid of white Jesus in classrooms, you think people would have said something? Who said that? Yeah, right? I don't know what they would have said, but they would have said something. <laughs> yeah, that would have been a thing. And, his, and it's like, so, and I'm going to ask him to speak for me because maybe he doesn't agree with me. Maybe he doesn't feel the same way I feel. But if you have a platform and if you have a spotlight, do you have a responsibility to speak on those issues that you do agree with for those people who, who don't? Hands up if you want to, if you think that you do have a responsibility. Okay. So here's the next question. Do white people have a responsibility to assist people of color? So I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but if you're, if you're white and in America, your voice matters more and is more likely to be heard than if you're a person of color. Right? That might be shocking, but it's true. Another thing is, and it doesn't stick with that, America has a checklist. If you're a woman, your voice to, the, to America is not as important as my voice as a man. However, if you're a white woman, I'm a black man, that would be a fun game to play to see who America cares about more or hates more. That would be really, really interesting. Yeah, I want to figure out a way to play that game later on. So we have, yeah, so you have a platform. You have a voice that I don't have. So do you have, do anybody feel you have a responsibility to speak on behalf? Or, or, what, do you, or what do you have a responsibility to do if you have one? I, I'll put that question on Facebook too. Let's see what, we, what our responses were. So one of the responses I got from my Facebook friends also, all the answers were from white people. I wanted to hear what white people had to say about this if I'm asking white people questions. <laughs> if I'm asking questions to white people, not white people, we're gonna be white people. Anyway, I'm ready to think.
That one. I chose yeah. it because I thought, uh, like, not everyone's comfortable maybe, like, doing, like, really, like, being outspoken about a topic like that, but I think to at least, like, have someone's back who is, is important. So the, uh, the stand with was really important to you. Yeah, I get that. That's cool. Anybody else? I thought I was a hand up. Yes, sir. That's a that's a big one. I like I like that a lot. I struggle with that too. Of like if 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 one of my if one of my female friends or somebody from the LGBTQ community posts something on Facebook that's about their struggle, and I'm like, oh yeah, I get I get that. But I don't click share because I'm worried about what, what are my boys going to think if I post this feminist thing. If I don't say anything, then that to me, that's almost just as bad as the people who are speaking against it. Like, I think silence is, big, is really important or significant. And I, that stood out to me, too. I like that. Thank you. Anyone else on that one? Why they want to vote for that? Why I like that one? The second one was, there's a few on this one, to join in the fight. Which anybody who voted for that one would like to say why they did that one? No pressure? Yes? Um, well, I like both of them, and I thought the second one kind of included a lot that the first did. Um, and by calling it a fight, that kind of like references that there like, will be pushback and would be and going in. Um, to me, kind of meant like going with the, um, like the uh, pushback and like still um, standing for what you believe in through it. Okay. Yeah, I like that. I think about and tr tr keep trying to keep link it back to sports related is what does it mean to be a team? Anybody ever, ever played on a team, high school, regular, whatever it may be, played on a team? Do you have anybody on your team who you didn't like? No? Anybody? A couple of people? Yeah. But they still your team and like nobody from another team can mess with them or pick or whatever. You can push him down a flight of stairs, but nobody else is allowed to talk. You know what I mean? Like, that's, that's it. So what does it mean to be a team? If, if we're, like, in America, if we're on the same team and one of your teammates is struggling, does that not mean that the team is struggling? And I think that's what the whole MLK thing was about, the whole dream thing of being together. If we're on one team, then there's not worried about, okay, well, the, the, the point guards have some issues or go to football, the wide receivers are struggling, but, we, but the rest of us are good. If your wide receivers are terrible, you, good luck trying to win football games. What's another sport? You play volleyball? No volleyball? So if the, the, the hitter person, libero? I'm sure this is, what is it called? The libero or the hitter? The libero mean? hitter person. The libero is the one who sets up the whole play. If the person who sets up the whole play, <laughs> if they're struggling, isn't it mean that the team is struggling? Or can the team just function smoothly and you don't worry about that person? So I like that joining the fight thing. Now I'm worried, because I thought the, I like the first one the best. Now I'm like that joining the fight, no one is going to be pushed back. Quick segue story that I didn't think I was going to say. <laughs> Anybody know? Uh, White woman works in the library and I think that she for her research. And on her door she has like these stickers and things like that. And she has this Black Lives Matter sticker on her door. And y'all, I'm telling y'all, when I walked in, I didn't realize how much tension I carry in my body as a person of color on this campus until like I saw a Black Lives Matter sticker on a white woman's office door. And was like, okay, this is, it was this weird thing. I'm like, okay, this is someone who did not have to join in the fight and chose to put it out there because she sees me as a teammate. I'm a human being. I'm Villanova. She's Villanova. We look out for each other. And she'd never met me before. But just putting that out there, because I know a lot of people that feel like, yeah, they think Black Lives Matter, but they won't say that publicly because they're worried about we call it the pushback. They're worried about the pushback they receive. 
I know a lot of men who have been in situations. I didn't. I was. I remember when I was younger, hearing men talk talk horribly and objectifying women and saying nothing. And I said nothing because I was worried about not having their acceptance or what they would think about me if I tried to shut that down. So like, so what is that? Like, what if, so what if, my, what if my mom watched that, was able to watch that whole thing happen and saw me say nothing? Or my sister saw that, or my daughter saw that. So what if you, and you and it's not even have like black friends. If you had someone say, like someone said, hey, do you think black lives matter? And you're like, I'm not gonna say that because I'm worried about pushback for it. Like, I don't know, that's like really weird that you won't acknowledge like facts because we're worried about that, but that's how the fight is. And I think for me, joining in the fight for like if a teammate is struggling, whatever it is. Tell me your name again? Cowan. Cowan. So if Cowan's struggling, what, what classes you got? Uh, Cowan. What, what classes you got that are, like, that are hard? Um, Cal <laughs> Cal Calc 3. Calc 3. That sounds awful. So if he's struggling in, in a Calc 3, and I feel like I want to help him somehow, but I'm like, ah, oh, I don't, that sounds hard. I got to dedicate my time and see what I can do and reach out, whatever. And I'm like, I don't want to do that because it'll discomfort me. I mean, he's in the class. So if I'm going to say, like, that's too much for me, imagine how he feels. He's the one that's in the class, you know? So if somebody's saying, yo, the struggle is real, I need some help, you're like, nah, that's a little uncomfortable. Like, no shit, it's uncomfortable. That's why we're asking for help. You know, it's about looking out for each other. So now I want to, do I want to change my thing? I don't know. We might, we might come back to these later. The last ones nobody voted for was do all you can not to get lumped in with racist white people. Anybody want to tell me why they did not vote for that one? Yes, ma'am. What's your name? Sydney. Okay, I get that. Any, yes. Um, What's your name? Carrie. Carrie. Yeah. So I didn't think it, and like not to hate on like your friend who posted it, but it's kind of making it about themselves when you're asking, like, make sure that I don't look like I'm the racist, as opposed to helping the person who's in need. Like, just so I do enough to get by, and I'm not lumped with the bad people, but I'm not necessarily doing anything to make it better either. Huh. I, I didn't think about that. Yeah. I, I figured that if I was going to vote, I didn't vote for that one just because I like the other ones better. But I didn't think about that. Is Yeah. Anybody else? You, okay. So with, so Sydney, with your, the, the point you made, like I feel you, but I'm, I'm thinking about like the peer pressure of like, who, you ever heard of like that mob response when things get rolling and you can get caught up in it and people just start cheering, especially with sports and the chants start going and people in the waves. Start. Have you, anybody ever been in a wave? You can't stop it. You can't do it. If you see it coming, you say like, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. Nope. Nope. No. Nope. Yeah. And you can't help it. It's so hard. It's so hard to not to resist that thing when everybody's doing it. Even if you know that and there's nothing wrong with the wave. I don't think. What if it turns out all this time the rave is the, the wave is like some horrible bigoted tradition that people have been doing for a long time? I feel terrible. Then I'll just stop doing the wave. I wouldn't sit here and be like, no, the wave is fun, like R. Kelly's music. No, I'm, I'm done. I'm done with you. So who knows? Who's ever heard of the Black 14? Here's a picture. Let's see. Let me see. This is like eight members of. Uh, the Black 14, this was in, back in, before 78, 69, it was a Wyoming football team. They had 14 African American players. And they were going to play Brigham Young University. And at, who laughed already? It was like, oh no, this is, this is gonna be good. <laughs> so they were gonna play Brigham Young U University. And at the time, Brigham Young, the Church of Latter-day Saints, said black people cannot be part of the priesthood. 
like you can't. We love you, but you can, I, I doubt they said we love you, but, <laughs> but you can't. So these 14 black players went to their coach and said, hey, we're playing this team who has this school that has these racist policies. We would like to do something to kind of protest and speak out against what they're doing. And the coach said, no. So then they came back again and said, we really want to do this. And what we want to do is we, wear, we just want to wear black armbands. That's all we want. We want to put a black armband on to show we're going to raise attention to this and that is wrong. And the coach name was Larry Eaton. He threw them off the team. So he's thrown. So first off, you're like a teenager or your early 20s. How, is anybody here over the age of 25? One person? Two people? Anybody here over 23? Okay, so y'all like under 23. Look, I'm 40, right? Yeah, I know, I'm 40. And the thing is, like, that's really, really young. And I'm not going to be like, get off my lawn. But y'all know how young that is. So just imagine you're, you're like 19, 20 years old. You're black. You're in Wyoming. It's probably a pretty lonely and isolated feeling. And your coach, the person who came to your house and said, I'll take care of you, you should come play on my team, has thrown you off the team? So here's what happened with that story. So they go to the football game. The, the 14 black players who were thrown off the team, they're at the game. And Wyoming wins. They have this big win against Brigham Young. And the coach, Larry Eaton, says because of everything that happened and the black guys causing all this ruckus and getting rid of them and they still winning, it was the most satisfying coaching win he's had in his life. That's what the coach said. Now here's where the thing kips in with everybody that a mob mentality is. While the game is going on, because all the students know what's, what's happening and, and the controversy is going on, and throughout the game, the students are chanting, we love Eaton. We love Eaton to show their support behind the coach. We love Eaton. We love Eaton. I'm like, can you imagine what's that like? What's that like? You got thrown off this team because you were trying to point out social injustice. You're like 20 years old. You're at the stadium, and all these white people are chanting something that sounds like on the surface is not negative, but they're doing it to show you that you don't belong and how scary that must be. I need somebody to help me out. Somebody raise their hand if they're willing to tell me somebody in their life who, they don't even in their life anymore. If you've ever known someone who you didn't like. Yes, in the back. What's their name? That's okay. I'm about to, I'm about to talk about everything. I'm about to talk about Villanova in a second. So go ahead and go ahead. What's it? Abby. So you can't stand Abby. Can you imagine what it would be like if you went to an event? You and Abby just had a fall down. You were like, we're good, I'm done. And you post on Facebook, hey, Abby was mean to me. I didn't do anything to Abby. I went to Abby and said, hey, Abby, I think this is disrespectful. And Abby slapped me in my face and threw me out of her apartment. And then you came in here, and everybody just started chanting, we love Abby. We lo Can we do that? Y'all want to help me out? Let's see how that feels. Let's see how that sounds, all right? Y'all ready? All right, we love Abby, 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 we love Abby. All right, let's stop. <laughs> See, that's like, that's like, it feels weird. Even though we're just in here messing around, it feels weird to do that, to target someone. Are you okay back there? Okay, let me make sure you bring up another, Abby! Hey. <laughs> of just like all those people, thousands and thousands of people, and it's just you and you're 14. You're 14, it's you and 13 other people. And you have to go to class with all these students who said this. Is that freedom? Are you free? What was one of them to be able to live with in the absence of fear? I don't know how if that's the absence of fear, I don't. I've never had a stadium of people 
chant against me like that. Like, I don't know if that's the absence of fear. I just don't know. So here's, and now I'm talking about collegiate sports. It's college athletes. Anybody, any college athletes in here? Anybody know any athletes? They got, they're like busy. They got like a lot of stuff going on. I personally think we should pay college athletes. I think they make a lot of money for the school and entertainment for us. But, so this, this gentleman, let's see, his name is Arian Foster, played for the uh, University of Tennessee in college. He played for the Houston Texans in the NFL. He's just a different dude. Hey, y'all know Arian, anybody know Arian Foster? Y'all a little young, huh? You know Arian Foster? He's just a, you ever heard an interview with Arian Foster? He's just a different type of, different type of cat. He played like six years and got out like, I'm not gonna bash my brain, I just came in for the money was good, and now I'm gonna go live my life. He said when he was in college, he had this game, there were 30,000 people at the stadium, and everybody screaming and cheering, and they won the game, and he had this big, huge game, and he signed, he signed, he stayed two hours after the game signing autographs for people, and there's all these vendors there, and the coaches are there, and all these people selling things, the people who were selling all these tickets and merchandise. He's signing jerseys for people. They're turning around and selling the jerseys. And he's like feeling really good. Like, look at all these people who are like here supporting me. And then he said he went back to his dorm room and he didn't have any food in his refrigerator. And it was like, something's not right. Like we have to at least admit that's a little weird. Like that everybody's getting paid except for the, for the workforce. What do you call it when you work for free? Volunteer? You want to volunteer? I guess you could. <laughs> that's a nice way to say it. Anybody else got a word for what it's called when you work for free? Slavery. Slavery? That's exactly what I say right now with this shutdown. All my air traffic controller friends working for free. How, how, how do you work, make people work for free? And some people have said, like, well, college athletes get room and board. And that's what the slaves got. Mm. Slaves got room and board, too. So what's the difference? They got an education? I guess, is education worth that much? What would you rather have, a degree from Villanova or $30 million? Raise your hand if you'd rather have a degree from Villanova. <laughs> Just because I want to see it. Raise your hand if you'd rather have $30 million. Doesn't mean we love Villanova any less. It's, just, it's weird though, right? Like, can we admit that it's, like, like it's weird that everybody makes money off of these students except them? No? I'm the only one who thinks it's weird? It may not be like, maybe paying us in, but it's just like, ah, it's a little uncomfortable. Let's see what we're on time. We got like 20 minutes left. Let's see what we got. So we have, who knows what the NFL, Major League Baseball, not as much. The NFL and the NBA have this thing called the Combine. Who knows what the Combine is? Anybody heard of the Combine? You know what that is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So everyone who enters a draft, they're there and you get, they check your height and your weight and they make you run, see how fast you are. You gotta jump up and hit some sticks and lift some weights and do all this stuff and everybody can just check you out, right? And like, no lie, it, it looks like a slave auction. So they had these slave auctions back in the day where they would bring all these slaves up and they would have the slaves standing there and people were examining their height and people who own the slaves would tell you how much they could lift and how strong they were, and then people pick which slave they wanted. And people would now say like, CJ, you can't compare the NFL auction and NFL to slavery and, and because that's like comparing apples and oranges. So let's do that, all right? So you have an apple, right? So apples and oranges. Apples are round, oranges are round, they grow on trees. They're both fruit. They're good for you. They both are used to make popular juices. 
And I'll be honest, let's see if you can see it from here. So here's a picture. Let's see, if we, let's see if we can do this. Let's try this one more time before they can see if it's going to happen. If not, just back up and down. All right. No? Stand still. I'll stand still. So this is a man being for the, coming from the NFL Combine. This is a, a painting of, a drawing of slave auction. That's an apple. That's an orange. That's an apple and an orange. This is pictures of a slave, of a slave auction on the left, pictures of the NFL Combine on the right. You tell me which things look more similar. So is this freedom? When I mean, you get a lot of money, right? If you're like one of them, I don't know any of these dudes, so I'm assuming none of these dudes got drafted. But is that is it freedom though? I don't know. Like freedom to do what? Here's our last thing we were gonna talk about. So we have. Come back. So this is Villanova's, Villanova's current di uh, demographic. Population is 65% white, 35% POC. Not gonna lie, y'all, I would have missed that by a million if I would have if I guessed what the percentage was between white people and people of color on this campus. So, of the 35% of the of the people of color. 25% of those people are African American. I wasn't able to find out exactly how many, what percentage of that is our athletes, but I think there's eight African Americans on our men's basketball team right now, and I want to play this game of how many black people, how many black men are on this campus that aren't athletes. So I need a volunteer. Who wants to play this game with me? I just need to know what classes you got. Yeah, so let's do this. Let's start your day. What's the first, so start your, start your week. The first class you have at week, what, what class is that? Uh, yeah. Uh, thermal fluids. Thermal what? Thermal fluids. Thermal fluids, y'all are smart. <laughs> Calthy thermal fluids. How many African American men are in your class? Uh, I think one. One. He, is, is he an athlete? He doesn't count. He's an RAL count. Let's go next. <laughs> Sorry, next class. Sustainability. How many African American men? I don't think there's any. All right. Next class. Manufacturing. Manufacturing. How many? I think one. One. Any other classes? Uh, the next class is another. Okay. And he's not an athlete. Two. So we got two. Oh, the same guy. Same person. Okay. We any any other any other one? Any other class? All right. I want to see how many classes, how many people we get to before we can get to the same amount of black guys on the basketball team that we have in class. Anybody else want to give me what class they got? I'll tell you, it's going to be awkward in here. But it's how we grow. Uh huh. Two, okay. Okay. Not in hating the athletes, I just want to show, I want representation. We're not all athletes. Like, look at me, I'm just cute and funny. That's all I, <laughs> that's all I got going for me. Then I have theology, so there's none. None? Okay. Um, then I have my agent's class, there's nothing. None, okay. And then I have social psychology. None. none. We can get to eight, y'all. We can get to eight. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's one that does play a sport in my first class. My second class, there's like five that don't. Five that don't play sports? Four that don't. Four that, we're at seven. Yeah. We need one more. And then I have one in an Ipsy class. That doesn't. I got one in my English class and one in my English class. Nine. One, two, three, four. We went through, well, how many people? How many people? Who, who, who participated in this? One, two, three, four. Four people. Five people. Like, how many classes? 20? 
we had to go through 20 classes, y'all, to get to the same amount of African-American men on the basketball team? That's a little weird, though, right? I'm not saying it's not right or wrong, but can we can admit, like, it's problematic might not even be the word, but a little, it's something. Is it, is it, my question is, is it worth talking about? Is it worth bringing up? Is it worth discussing? What do y'all think? Or is it something we just need to be silent about? Because again, if they're not listening to me, we said they would have listened to Mikael Bridges, right? I also think they would have listened to y'all. We're on the same team, right? We're on the same team. We got to start being teammates. I think freedom, I like the, the freedom is living within the absence of fear. And I don't always feel safe on this campus. And I, think it's be, and I don't think it's because the majority of people on this campus are racist. I don't think that at all. I think there's probably very few people on this campus that are racist. But, my, but I'm concerned about if the people who are not racist, will they stand up and say something? So let me talk about just the women in here for a second. Do you all feel safe on this campus all the time? And would you feel safer if more men were black plastering all kinds of stuff, feminist stuff on their Facebook pages? And you had hashtag me too in Windows instead of whatever thing that people have in Windows. Like if you had more people, if you had more men advocating for you, would that make you feel a little safer? It's the same thing. Everybody got something. Red my Cal 3 do that. If you had everybody being like, you can do it, dude. You got, it. I got you. I can't, I don't know Cal, I, that's not my struggle, but I got your back. What do you need? You need me to tell everybody to shut up so you can study? Yeah, right, shut up! All right, what do you need? If you had that, you still got to take the test, but does it at least make you feel a little comfortable, like we got your back? Yeah. That's all I'm saying. We on the same team. We got to have each other's back, all right? That's my time. I thank you all for coming out and listening to me. Greatly appreciate it.